So I'm so excited to be teaching Revelation. So Becky and I found ourselves with a little bit of time and we were standing next to this Apple store. So we went inside and they sell these um, goggles. And I said to the fella, give me your best uh, pitch on these goggles. I want to I wanna know about these things. He said, well, oh, it's much better if you try them on. I said, let's do it. And uh, uh, so I said, but I'd like it to be like a dual try-on. I want my wife to try these on too. And he said, okay. And they figured out we could do it. They had an opening. and We slotted right in there. First of all, the fellow who's doing Becky's is saying, well, I've never seen anybody catch on this fast. <laughs> Which means he was trying to sell us. Whereas the woman with me, who has seen plenty of people go faster, clearly wasn't trying to sell us. But <laughs> this thing was, um, it's, it's just, it makes you want to watch movies. It's like total immersion. Like you're there. And I thought, boy, really makes you appreciate and love a good movie. Now, there are some movies that are just entertaining, but there are some movies that are, in addition to being entertaining, rise to a level of art. Um, art, to me, isn't just entertaining. It's something with a message. So, you know, those few movies that are beyond entertainment, that are the true classics with a, a message that really communicate in the highest form of art. Movies like The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, which have taken the sublime to a new level. Now in that movie, if you've watched it 50 times like I have, you at least, you are well aware of the fact that Clint Eastwood represents what's good. Lee Van Cleef represents what's bad. And Eli Wallach, bless his heart, well, he's just ugly. <laughs> but I thought about that as I was getting ready to present the Revelation class today. Because Revelation came out before Google Glasses. Goggles, not Google. Apple Google Goggles. For those things that we bought, in, <laughs> it, it came out before that. The book of Revelation came out before movies, before photos. But in a way, it's its own version of cinema because it's got these elaborate pictures that are painted with words. It's got these visions that are recorded in a way to, to put the vision into your brain. It's like a movie that's got a message. It's like art. And it's something that a lot of people in the church stay away from because the tendency is to say, I don't get that. Which is fair, but we don't want to stay away from it. We want to study it. There is no other book in the Bible that I can think of, so maybe there is, but I really don't think there is, that pronounces a blessing on you when you read it or you listen to it. Blessed is the one who reads aloud. That makes it a movie. Reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Blessed are those who hear it. And to keep what's written in it, the time is near. Now, if you ever go to Copenhagen, you want to go to the Thorvaldsen Museum. Bertolt Thorvaldsen was a, a, a Danish sculptor over 100 years ago, like 1800s. And among his sculptures, he did the 12 apostles. And I love his sculpture of the apostle John. 
Because if you, if you get a chance to see it, the Apostle John, you'll notice he's gazing upward into heaven. He's got his tablet and his pen. I tried to blow it up so you can see it. The pen does not touch the tablet. He's not writing yet. He's looking up to heaven to get the word from the Lord to write. He's not writing out of his own. He's writing out of a revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. And John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book. Write the movie. And so he's writing. It's a great sculpture because it puts the emphasis on the divinity behind the words of Revelation. So what I'd like to do is look at Revelation with you in three things, three parts this morning. First, I want to talk to you about some symbolism, relevant especially as we look to the letters today, and then we'll have our points for home. But let's start talking in general about symbolism. Now, you've heard it over the last five weeks. I've had this slide or something close to it up each time. There are certain traits that are common in apocalyptic literature. And John is that type of literature. It's apocalyptic literature. One of those traits is the use of symbolism. This becomes important to us because we need to understand and be warned as we read this that not all of the images that you see are symbols. Many of them are. But some of them are just part of the movie. So you shouldn't try to press for every little detail of, all right, well, what does this represent and what does that represent? Because that's not a fair thing to do. This is a movie. And I don't mean there are very important symbols. Clint Eastwood is the good. Lee Van Cleef is the bad. Eli Wallach is ugly. There, there are symbols, but there are things that are not, they're, they're just part of the movie. Because this is, this is a picture being painted for you. And we will understand most of the symbols simply by being people of the book. Because most of the symbols are in the Bible, and the Bible explains what they are. But in the midst of trying to understand the symbols, we must never lose our attention, our focus, on the message of the book. It is so easy for us to get wrapped up in understanding the symbols or understanding this vision that we lose track of the focus of the book. I've heard a sermon one time and I've read in several books people who tend to take symbolism too far and lose focus on a message. And I thought I'd give you a good example in my mind. And that is from a parable. Many of us know the parable of the Good Samaritan. Fellow, fellow goes up, it's in Luke 10. Fellow goes up to Jesus, says, uh, what do I need to do to be saved? He says, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Well, you know, I, who's my neighbor? And Jesus says, there was a man who left Jerusalem, was going down to Jericho, and he was besat upon by robbers and laying in the ditch half dead. A priest comes by and just walks right around him. A Levite comes by and just walks right around him. And then a Samaritan, who everybody held in disgust, a Samaritan comes by, the Samaritan sees him, he binds his wounds with oil and wine and takes him to an inn, gives two shillings to the innkeeper and says, I'll come back and if I owe you more, I'll give you more later. Okay? I've heard the sermon. I've seen the books that interpret this as this elaborate symbolism. I will suggest to you it's wrong. So I put it up here as nope. 
Here's the way it goes. The man is Adam. And Adam leaves from Jerusalem, which is the heavenly city, or perhaps heavenly thoughts, or perhaps even the Garden of Eden. And he goes down to Jericho, which represents the earthly passions. He's besat upon by robbers, which are Satan and his minions. And the priest comes by, and the priest represents the law. But the law can do nothing for this half-dead man who has uh, lost his uh, health and safety by leaving the divine city and being besat upon by Satan. And then the Levite comes by, and that represents the sacrifices of the Old Testament. But they'll do no good either. They can't touch the man. So the good Samaritan comes by and that's Jesus. And the oil with which Jesus ministers is the Holy Spirit. And the wine is the blood of the passion of Christ. And then Christ puts the man on his mule, which represents the righteousness that Jesus has, and takes him to the inn, which represents the church. There he pays two shillings. That's the word and the sacraments that have been given to the church. And he promises to return. Well, I'm sorry. That's not what the Good Samaritan's about. Now, don't get me wrong. Jesus does save us the way priests and sacrifices can't. And we do get besat upon by Satan and his minions. I mean, the, the narrative is, is not an unbiblical narrative. It's just not the point of the Good Samaritan. The point of the Good Samaritan is pretty simple. The point of the Good Samaritan is, who's my neighbor? Answer, whoever you meet that needs you. Have a good day. So not all the symbols or images are symbols and we mess never getting so wrapped up in symbols that we lose focus of the message. See, Revelation was written to be read and heard by the church that it was sent to or the churches that it was sent to as well as by us. But the core message is to comfort the church and the believers in the struggle against the forces of evil. That's the purpose of this book. We should not be reading this book with the purpose being in our mind to figure out when Jesus is coming again and whether or not the Ukraine war is talked about in here. <laughs> the purpose of this book is to comfort us in our struggle against the forces of evil. And so when you read the book, these verses will jump out at you if you're reading it for the message of the book. And you'll see that God sees our tears. Revelation 7, 17. Revelation 21, 4. He'll wipe them away. God sees our tears. This book teaches us that prayer makes a difference. If you heard Jarrett this morning, I took this picture while he was preaching. He's preaching on prayer. We're in a real battle. We have a real enemy. We are a real target. There is a war, a, a battle going on. And God hears the prayers of his saints. Prayer makes a difference. Revelation teaches that to the church who needs comfort and needs direction fighting the evils of this world. The book teaches that death is precious in God's sight. Death is not the end. Death is a, a stage. I mean, the, the butterfly story is applicable. The caterpillar dies and becomes a butterfly. Death is precious in God's sight. He has defeated death 
so that it does not have the eternal consequences it would have otherwise. But there is a resurrection power in Jesus. And that's why the book teaches us that final victory is assured. That Christ lives and reigns forever. That Christ will return to live with us. That is the comfort this book gives to the church in its struggle against the forces of evil. That comfort is there for you and me. As we struggle against the forces of evil, we need to understand the comfort that's offered in this book. That's why it's a blessing to read and to understand it and to hear it and to walk in it. So it comforts the church in its struggle against the forces of evil. But the book also teaches us that Christ wins over the dragon, who is Satan, and his minions. Christ wins. And so you read the book and you'll see passages like in chapter 11, verses 7 through 10, where it looks like the beast is going to be victorious. But you keep reading, because he isn't. So as we read through these symbols, we need to recognize some of the symbols are clearly historical events, but almost all of them are principles. And so we're reading for the principles, not simply reading to figure out the answer to how we want the future to unfold. People who... I, 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 We'll do this frequently. I've done it before with the Mark of the Beast, but I've gone through and tried to look at people historically in just the last 200 years of literature and scholarship who've written on this. And oh, this is the passage that clearly is talking about Napoleon. Here's the passage that clearly is describing World War I. Or I found one that said it was the Balkan War that preceded World War I. Oh, here's the passage that talks about Hitler. Some, the passage that talked about Mussolini. Some, the passage that talked about the German Emperor Wilhelm. We don't need to be looking at the symbolism in that light. We need to be trying to understand the principles that are here because those principles will drive our appreciation and edification of the letters and, the, and of the revelation. So, let's get to the letters. The letters start in chapter 2, but remember, John didn't put chapter 1, chapter 2. That's an addition over a thousand years later. Chapter 1 flows into chapter 2, they're a unity. So chapter 1, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Church history records during the reign of Emperor Domitian, he was, uh, uh, John was placed on Patmos uh, uh, because he, he, of his faith. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches. To Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Now, those are real churches. He's on the island of Patmos, 30 miles offshore of Turkey. But those are real churches, and they actually follow the road, if you're walking the road around. They're listed geographically in the order in which you would go to them. But the fact that it's seven is also something we should not be ignoring. So John turns to see the voice speaking to him. And when he turns, he sees seven golden lampstands. And in the midst, in other words, encircled around him is one like a son of man. We've talked before. The temple had one lampstand. This is seven. And Jesus is in the middle of them. And so the seven golden lampstands with Jesus in the middle is a notable picture in the movie that you don't want to lose. Among these traits, we have the peculiar use of numbers. We know, for example, the number three is a heavenly number. Four is an earthly number. You add them together, get seven a complete number. 
Multiply and get 12, a complete number. In the right hand, Jesus holds the seven stars. From his mouth comes a, a, a two-edged sword. It's not the number two. It's just the kind of sword. His face was like the sun shining in full strength. Now, the seven stars and the two-edged sword? Pretty scary picture. So when John sees him, John falls to his feet and says, Oh, I'm scared. And Jesus says, Fear not, I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one. I died. Behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. So write these things that you've seen that are those, those that are and those that are to take place after this. Then Jesus gives an explanation of the stars and the lampstands. Jesus says the following. As for the mystery, mysterion is, is the, the Greek word for mystery, but it's, it, it can be used as a symbol. As for the symbolism. As for the symbolism of the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the stars are the angels of the seven churches. Angels. Um, the stars are the seven uh, uh, angels, angeloi. Um, an angel could be the angels that we think of as angels, the angelic beings. It's also the common word for a messenger. So a lot of um, commentators consider this a, a statement about the, the pastors, the preachers, the ministers of the gospel in each church. But uh, I can see arguments both ways. I don't get hung up on it. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So the seven, that number, the complete, this is for all churches of all time. The churches surround Jesus. Jesus is in the middle of the churches. So if we understand that, we begin to grasp that these letters, while written to seven specific churches, are written to the church for all time. They're letters you and I should read and take to heart. Now, each of the letters, and there are seven of them, each of the letters appropriately has seven parts. There are one or two exceptions, and those are notable because they are exceptions. But the seven parts of each letter are as follows. First part is a salutation or an address. Who it's to. The second part is a designation of Christ. And the designation of Christ, by the way, in each one is finely tuned to what the message is. The third is a commendation, a thumbs up for the various churches. And that's followed by a condemnation, a thumbs down. The fifth part is a warning or a threat. The sixth part is an exhortation. Come on now, you can do it. And then it ends with a promise. So that's the basic form of each of these letters. And we'll start with the first letter to the church at Ephesus. And we begin with the salutation or address. To the angel of the church of Ephesus, right. And again, the, some of the compelling argument for believing that angel is to be translated as the messenger it would be the person who's doing the reading perhaps to the church of this letter it would be the one who is ministering to the church the 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 pastors over the churches or the bishops to the angel of the church in Ephesus right now Ephesus as we discussed is up here Ephesus is a town where the church was started in the early 50s by Paul and, and it's, if you ever get to go to the ruins, the ruins are spectacular. They're my favorite ruins in the, in the ancient world, biblical world. Um, uh, just amazing what you can see. Uh, here's one of the two amphitheaters that are still there. Uh, uh, this is one of the roads. You can, you can see ruts 
that have been built into the roads from the chariots that, that have gone up and down over the, the eons and ages. This is a library that was built uh, uh, somewhere closer to the time of John than the time of Paul. It would not have been there at the time of Paul. But that's the facade, the, the outside of that library. Um, and uh, you, you can go there and, and just go down these roads. So Paul starts that church, or God starts that church through Paul in the 50s. Around 57 AD, Paul gives his tearful goodbye to the elders there. But it's a solid church. It looks like Paul probably went back after his imprisonment. But he left Timothy in charge for a good while. Church history teaches that when Rome invaded Jerusalem around 66 AD and, and Rome fought the Jewish populace there, that the Apostle John left Jerusalem along with the mother of Jesus, Mary, and they went to Ephesus. And that's where he was. And so this was his home turf as well. And it's, it's uh, uh, fascinating, uh, the studies that can be done on that. But Ephesus is a church that started out as, as a centerpiece church for that part of Asia Minor. And so, Paul, so John writes to the angel of the church in Ephesus. And then part two of these letters, the designation of Christ... Christ calls himself here the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven lampstands. Now, Jesus is going to give some insightful information to the church at Ephesus. And rightfully so, because he reminds them in this part of the letter, he's standing and walking among the churches. God is present in the church. Don't doubt his knowledge. God is present here. His spirit is present among us. We should not doubt that he knows or, does, or, 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 or is aware of our hearts, our minds, what we're doing, what we're thinking. God is fully aware because Jesus is in our midst. So then the commendation. Jesus says, I know your works, erga. I know your toil. I know your patient endurance. I know how you can't bear with those who are evil. I know that you've tested those who call themselves apostles and are not. I know you found them to be false. I know you're enduring patiently. I know you're bearing up for my name's sake. I know you've not grown weary. What wonderful commendations! But look at the condemnation. But I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. My brain works a little bit like um, a file cabinet. Those of you who are old enough, remember what those were? Those of you who are this generation? Uh, it's kind of like an internal Google. So my brain works like those file cabinets. And so I see this passage, and I can remember the first time it caught my attention. I was taking a, um, I was hearing a sermon on Revelation. Can't give the exact age. It was at the Broadway Church in Lubbock, Charles. I think Terry Cartwright was teaching it. 
He's probably still alive. Terry, I don't mean to say you were teaching it if you weren't. But whoever was teaching it said, what do you think the first love was? And started listing all these different things. And so over the years, I've heard all of these people list all these different things. Some think the first love was missions. They had a missionary heart. They were out there taking the gospel to the world. And they'd quit. Some thought the first love was and fill in the blank. I mean, there's a litany of things. I, I, I have another suggestion. I have this against you. You have abandoned the love, the agape. You have abandoned your love. This church was working hard. They were striving for doctrinal purity. They were holding accountable false teachers and false apostles. They were toiling. They were patiently enduring. They were working their fingers to the bone without love. What does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 13? You know it. I could call half of you up here and you could quote it. Love is front and center here. But look what Paul says. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but don't have love, I'm a noisy gong. I'm a clanging cymbal. I can speak like an angel. But without love, I'm a noisemaker. If I have prophetic powers, if I understand all the mysteries and all the knowledge and I have all the faith, I can move mountains, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. If I give away everything I have, deliver my body up to be burned, but don't have love, I gain nothing. Look at what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. It's in the introductory part of that letter. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 3. Paul says this. Start with verse 2. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor... Of love. Labor that proceeds from love. Jesus said in John 14, 23, famous passage. John 14, 23. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and will come to him and make our home with him. You can work your fingers to the bone. But if you're not working out of a loving heart to God and others. You have abandoned the love that you had at first. And Jesus says this is what I have against you. And I'll tell you, that principle is true in the church. It's true in your marriage. You can do everything your spouse expects you to do. You can be exactly the things, working bee things, that your spouse wants you to do. But if you're doing those out of duty and obligation... You know, uh, Dr. Floyd tells the story, or told the story. He's passed away. He said uh, well, he was in Japan visiting some students that he had had over his lifetime. And at one of the cities, one of, the, one of his students said to him, Dr. Floyd was my major professor. He was my Greek professor, I should say. Um, Dr. Floyd said one of his students in Japan 
after the visit said, uh, where do you go next? And Dr. Floyd said, to this next city. And the student said, well, I'll take you to the train station and I'll ride the train with you to get you there. And, and Dr. Floyd said, you don't need to do that. I can, I can get there myself. And the student said, no, no, no. This is my obligation. This is my responsibility. This is the work I must do. And the student did it. And that next town, after Dr. Floyd had finished the visit, Dr. Floyd was going to the next town to visit another set of students. And the student said, Dr. Floyd, where are you going next? I'm going to Osaka or wherever it was. He says, well, I will go with you. Dr. Floyd said, you don't need to do that. And he said, it would be my honor. Dr. Floyd said, I felt different between the fella who did it out of obligation and the fella who did it out of love. And he suggested to us, if we don't understand that difference, we can try it at home with our spouses. <laughs> Mark, would you help me with this? It would be my obligation. <laughs> as opposed to it would be my honor. The same is true for church. If you can be the most active person in this church, you can meet, and greet, you can hand out donuts. You can run camera, you can run sound, you can run internet. By the way, all those people are amazing people, but what makes it amazing is they're all doing it out of love, not out of obligation. All right. Part five of the letter. The warning or the threat? Jesus says, remember therefore from where you've fallen, repent. Do the works the way you did them at first. Do the works out of love. If not, I'll come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. You will not be the light shining for the world to see unless you're shining for love. He does give them another commendation for hating the works of the Nicolaitans. And you say, well, what was the work of the Nicolaitans? Oh, 50,000 people will read 50,000 things into that. Bottom line is, nobody knows Well, a good case can be made. Yeah, I know. A good case can be made for 30 different reasons or explanations. The bottom line is, is it does indicate to us that this was written to a specific church at a specific point in time with specific issues. And then we're still edified by knowing and understanding that the love we have for the Lord and His kingdom does not mean that we love evil. And then the exhortation at the end. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. By the way, that echoes Jesus over and over and over. <laughs> to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. An image that comes out of Genesis 2 and is common throughout the Bible and will be rejoined at the end of Revelation when the new Jerusalem comes. So that's the seven parts, the promise being that seventh part, sorry, uh, the one who conquers. And each letter has that. Now we've done one letter, let's do the other, second letter for today. And this is the letter to Smyrna. And so it begins with a salutation or an address to the angel of the church in Smyrna. Right, part two. Now, Smyrna was built up onto a hill, and it was supposedly one of the most beautiful cities in antiquity. But what's most powerful to me is who the bishop of Smyrna was. Carol Wilson's here. Carol Wilson's told me she's going to read about Polycarp. I would urge you to read, you can read one of Polycarp's letters, we've still got that today, but there is an eyewitness to his death, his martyrdom. It's called the Martyrdom of Polycarp. I'd urge you to read it. Polycarp, born 69, so if Revelation's written in 95, he was what, 25, 26? Lives to be an old fella, 87 or something. Just keep that in mind. We'll come back to it. Part two. The designation of Christ. Christ calls himself here, says the words of the first and the last who died 
and came to life. All of his designations become important. You know, he told the Ephesians, I'm the one with the lampstands, so get your love back or I'll move your lampstand. Here we see he's the one who died and came to life. That gives us a foreshadowing of what this letter is going to say. And so in verse 9, we get the commendation. He says, I know your tribulation. Thlepsis. I know your poverty. They were poor in the world's world, but they're rich spiritually. He said, I know the slander of those who say they're Jews but aren't. They're just a synagogue of Satan. So there was some persecution from folks claiming a Jewishness that Jesus saw as inauthentic. Now, that should be a condemnation. Jesus does not have a condemnation for the church at Smyrna. It's missing. So we just go to the warning. And the warning is one that's very understandable. Jesus says, do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And then for 10 days, 10 represents a, a, a full time period, a, a fullness. So whatever the time period is. For that full time period, for 10 days, you'll have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, says the one who conquered death in Hades. See that tie back into who Jesus identified as. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Be faithful unto death. Polycarp. Um, I should have brought the martyrdom of Polycarp, but I quote from it in, in, in one of my books. <laughs> Polycarp gets this letter. Polycarp receives this. Polycarp, history tells us, studied at the feet of John the Apostle. He knew John the Apostle personally. Polycarp is the bishop of the church at Smyrna later in life. He's got this letter saying, be faithful unto death. Polycarp had an arrest warrant put out for him late in his life because he would not bow to Caesar. He was wanted for his faith as the bishop and leader of the church. So the church takes him out of the city and they hide him in the countryside. The police and the military find two slave boys who after being tortured told the authorities where Polycarp was. So the mounted police, the soldiers on horseback go out to find this old, old Christian man. Polycarp knew they were coming. So the people hiding him in the barn said, we got to get you out of here. we got to move you somewhere else. Polycarp says, no, we don't. Quote, may God's will be done. The police arrive. Polycarp hears it and comes down on his own. Doesn't make him find him. The cops that show up to arrest him the cops, not meant as a pejorative. Uh, I honor our people who serve in the police force. And I just realized as I said that, that some people take that offensively. I don't mean it that way at all. Um, uh, so excuse me for that. The, the officers that came to arrest him were stunned, first of all, at how old he was. It's kind of like, wait, we brought all our weapons and, all, and we brought the SWAT team for this guy? <laughs> But they were also amazed at his composure. Because the first thing Polycarp does is he says, Hey, 
these guys have missed their dinner because they're looking for me. Can y'all get them some food so they can eat? And then he looks at the soldiers and says, and while you're eating, would you give me one hour to pray? And they said, okay, not realizing he was going to stand there while they ate at the dinner table and pray out loud. And he went for two hours, not one. I was thinking about saying this when Jarrett was preaching this morning on the power of prayer in this evil fight we have. So he stands there for two hours praying out loud for every person he could remember that he'd ever come into contact with. His captors regretted coming after, quote, such a godly old man. But they still took him into the city. That was their job. He gets told by the state authorities, just say Caesar is Lord, burn a little incense, and you can go back to business as normal. Polycarp said, quote, I am not going to do what you are suggesting to me. They pull Polycarp straightway into the stadium where the crowd noise rises so high that nobody can be heard. Polycarp and the Christians with him heard a voice from heaven as he entered saying, Be strong, Polycarp, and act like a man. The proconsul asked Polycarp whether he was indeed the legendary and wanted man. Polycarp said, Yes. The proconsul tries to persuade Polycarp to swear to the genius of Caesar. In fact, to the Romans, Christians were atheists. Because they didn't believe Caesar was God. And they didn't believe all the rest of the Roman pantheon were God. So the proconsul says to him, Say, away with the atheists. Deny the Christians. But Polycarp instead looks at the whole crowd of lawless heathen people in the stadium and motions towards them and says, Away with the atheists. Not what the magistrate intended. The magistrate says, swear the oath, I'll release you. Revile Christ. Polycarp says, for 86 years I have been his servant. And he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? If you vainly suppose that I will swear by the genius of Caesar as you request and pretend not to know who I am, listen carefully. I am a Christian. Now, if you want to learn the doctrine of Christianity, name a day and give me a hearing. So, the proconsul's uh, stunned, but says, you know, I got no choice. They erect the pyre to burn him at the stake. They're about to nail him to the stake to burn him. And he says, uh, you don't need to nail me. Leave me as I am. For he who enables me to endure the fire will enable me to remain on the pyre without moving. Even without the sense of security you get from nails. So instead of nailing him, they just tied him up. He looks up to heaven. He offers a prayer of praise to God, testifying to God's love through Jesus. And as he declares amen, the fire is lit. And the pagans continued to tell the tale of Polycarp because everybody was moved by the faith of, of this man. This man had gotten a letter from Jesus in his youth that said, be faithful unto death. And this man took that letter seriously. This man heard the exhortation in the, that letter. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He knew the promise of the letter. He knew that the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. These are powerful letters for us to read. This is a powerful book for us to read. And it brings me to our points for home. 
Point for home one. Christ is with us. In the midst of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man. This is true on a corporate level. This is also true on a personal level. Every one of you. Christ is in the middle of what you're about in your life. He knows what you're going through. He knows the, the good drives. He knows the destructive drives. And his love is overwhelming. Because he wants nothing but the best. This whole thing is not some harsh, judgmental God trying to wrap your knuckles with a ruler. This is a God who's trying to seek the very best for you to give you the highest joys, the greatest victories. This is a God who loves you and is teaching you and reminding you love is the key. Don't abandon the love that should drive you to Christ. But remember what Scripture says. We love because He first loved us. If we don't understand and grasp the love of God, the unconditional, the love of God that washes away everything we've done wrong, the love of God that seeks to hold us close to Him, that wants to buff, polish, and shine us into the most brilliant piece of art we can be. If we don't understand the love of God that in mercy and tenderness reaches down and in judgment on the negative, He doesn't like the things that hurt you and hurt His children. He wants the absolute best. But we've got to be motivated by love ourselves. Don't ever think doing right or doing wrong is the end unto itself. It's not. It's the instruction to help us have a better life in service to our God and King and loving Father and Savior. The goal is to become more like Jesus and His love for the world. And so we, we understand his, his instructions, we understand His guidance as the means to the end of becoming like Him. And so in that regard, semper fidelis, or as the Marines would say, semper fi, always faithful. Jesus says, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. I don't wish the martyrdom of Polycarp on any of you. But what would it be like to have that kind of faith? I figure the best we can do is in our little world and in our little struggles, we can be faithful. That's what we need to strive to do. Let me pray for us, please. Lord, we ask you in the name of Jesus to tenderly touch our heart and restore in us or create in us a purer love. A love that issues forth in what we do in kindness, in gentleness, in self-control, in faithfulness, in confidence of who you are. The one who conquered death. It is an honor to be your child. Through Jesus our Lord, amen.